Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I am absolutely delighted to have with me Dr. Shamika Gerald. She is the principal of Heritage High School in Newport News, Virginia, and is about to take on a new job as the Director of Equity Assessment and Strategic Operations for the district. Shamika, thanks for being here. And um, tell us a little bit about uh, your school and maybe the district, right, and sort of the kind of students and families that you serve. Um, so a little bit about our school. We are one of five high schools in our school division. We have about 1,200 students at Heritage in particular. Um, we have a governor STEM academy, a university magnet program. Each of our schools in our division has some kind of specialty program. Um, really the focus in our building has been on youth development and student leadership over the past six years. We've won some, some awards in our school division national, locally, nationally. Um, for our students' efforts in leadership. And we work very cl closely actually with Jostin's Renaissance and our kids. I've done a podcast for them and our kids are gonna be focused on the student leadership podcast for them. So really that's um, where we are. We serve a very diverse population of students, um, but we, we, the population that we serve is an under-resourced community in particular, like our zone students come from um, an under-resourced community. So really our focus is here on developing leadership skills that translate to academic growth as well. So it's not just academics, but we focus on the whole child. Um, so that's pretty much us in a nutshell. One of the things is that um, conveniently, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we were one of the first one-to-one -one high schools in our school division. Um, we actually were the first one-to-one -one high school and we were the first school to pilot the Khajiit um, Wi-Fi bus program. Um, so we have had, I think, in our school division, we're in a unique situation. We've had a little bit more experience working in maybe a blended-ish environment um, versus some other places where the Band-Aid is completely ripped off and you give everybody a Chromebook and say, here you go, have at it. So. Got it. Okay. So, uh, so the governor closes schools uh, on the same day that you uh, defend your doctorate. So congratulations for that, by the way. Thank you, uh, March 23rd at 104. <laughs> That's also my birthday. So a very special day all around. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then you moved online. So tell us a little bit about your school's transition and what learning and teaching has looked like, particularly in a school that really values student leadership and agency. Um, I think for us, it was a very different situation than some of the surrounding schools because we had been one-to-one. -one. This was our third, actually our fourth year being a one-to-one -one high school. So the transition for us wasn't as drastic because we didn't have to get Chromebooks or hotspots to our students. Um, some of them may not have had a hotspot because they were relying on the internet in the school building to get some of their assignments done, maybe after school, or maybe they were going to a library. But I think the transition to fully online really hit us when it came to developing and maintaining relationships with students and families. I think that was one of the, the things that we faced a challenge with. I, I think our teachers adapted pretty well and our school division did a phenomenal job of putting together professional development that was kind of tiered to support because they knew that you have a school that's been one-to-one -one and now there are three of the high schools that are one-to-one. -one. So like, how do you scale it so not everybody is getting Google Classroom 101? Um, so they really have done a, a great job with that. And we really encouraged more creativity for students and teachers and that it doesn't have to look the same. I think that was one of the sticking points, helping, helping everyone understand that we're in not a remote learning environment. We're not in um, blended learn. We're in emergency remote. There's a difference. Um, and that it doesn't have to look the same and that we could kind of break away and really have some conversations about some cool activities that we could do with kids in a remote environment. So, um, then, so you, could you share a couple of examples of what that creativity has looked like? Um, for us in particular, like our health and PE teachers, and one of the things is um, I just got off of a lead teacher meeting today. One of my lead teachers in the world languages was like, well, it's so hard, but the health and PE team developed like flip grid videos and kids were supposed to do these exercises and they had to do the research and then they were posting them and they were like doing like just 
not doing doing the work, but not doing it the same and allowing technology to kind of help you develop some of those activities and resources um, that you can use with kids. And I always tell them, the kids probably know more about the tools than we do, so let them be the ones to, you know, do it and they can show you but also, you know, accepting assignments in multiple ways. Like, you don't, if it's a paper and it's a research project, does it have to be a paper? Could it be a video? Could it be, um, and, and stuff like our teachers were that, they left, I have an English teacher, um, Dr. Jennings, she was using um, Screencastify to do comments and feedback to kids on their papers, like while she was editing, she was able, so some of the stuff that, some folks are like, oh, that's so creative. That was already embedded in our work. And so she shared that practice with some other teachers and they were like, oh, you're right. I could give feedback using Screencastify. They could see me, they could see the screen, they could see where it is in real time and maybe that's a better way. But also how does that translate to when we get back, if we get back? Like, could we still use some of those practices? So that was, that was one. Cool, thanks. Um, so what have been some decisions that your leadership team has made that seem to work pretty well? Um, one of the decisions I think that has worked really well is that my school leadership team and my instructional leadership team, which includes my like department chairs, we have moved over to um, a remote environment, I guess. I, I, I'm not going to promote Microsoft Teams. I, that's just what we use. Um, but we use Microsoft Teams. Um, for our communication tool. And that was something we had started as a leadership team with the assistant principals at the very beginning of the school year. Um, and in this environment, it has made it so much easier for us to communicate. And it, and it was hard because we have to accept that we're in a different place now. It was very hard, but I think now the team is thankful that we started in last August with it just because I didn't want a thousand emails. It has a chat function. We can put our OneNote notebook there. Everything is in one place. Now we're in a place where we have to depend on that for communication and for organization of our work. And so we have put our lead teachers or, or department chairs on there as well. So I think one of the decisions was focusing on remote leadership for us versus just focusing on um, technology, instruction with technology for teachers. Because I feel like if we can become comfortable as school leaders in this environment, it lends itself for, to teachers to be less anxious if we're feeling more confident in our work. So that was one of the decisions. And then the other one, we focused on the social emotional needs of our staff, like staff check-ins, you know, and when, when we know somebody's really struggling, we make it a, a concerted effort to come out. We do... Um, I didn't think it was going to take off as well as it did, but we do office hours where I do like just rant. You can come, it's optional, but we have had some rich conversations around the best flavors of uh, oodles and noodles, ramen noodles versus oodles and noodles. If you eat them out of the styrofoam cup, if you don't, do you use the sauce packet? Do you just saute in butter? Like it, there have been some very deep conversations around that work, but one of the pieces of feedback from that has been that the teachers felt like they still had that connection to their school and they were like, they needed that laugh. The first, I think the first one we did was like, we did a toilet paper challenge. Who could come up with the most toilet paper in their home? And it was like, we all had toilet paper stacked up. And then one we did, what's your favorite snack? So you had to come and show us your favorite snack. So it, we've done some different things, but it all, and it wasn't something that we planned. It was all from quiet space where on the meeting, nobody was talking and we were just kind of looking at each other and working, it's open and somebody sparks a conversation and it goes into a full hour and a half conversation about ramen noodles. And if you don't know this, they have a cheese flavored ramen noodle that does not taste like macaroni and cheese. It has a spice, a little slow heat is what they say. So we have ordered a case of those um, to distribute to the staff <laughs> just because we had talked about it. So now everybody wants to try it. Very nice, very nice. I think that so, was good. Good, so Shemika, I'm gonna ask you a question. I don't know if I've asked anybody else, um, probably because I just love talking with you. Um, so what's been the hardest part of the last couple of months? And as you think about those really tough challenges, how have you all responded to those? 
I think the roughest parts have been not being able to connect with our kids in a way that we were able to do before and then helping our teachers deal with that. So um, dealing with kids and working with kids every single day in a building where you can literally hug them, you know that there's something wrong with them just by the way they're moving. And, and the same is true for adults. You can see an adult walk in the buildings like, I gotta go check on McLeod today because when he walked in, he didn't look like his usual peppy self. I think that has been the biggest challenge for us. Um, and I don't know if we've really solved that issue. We've worked a lot about um, on social emotional needs of our staff. We've worked a lot on focusing on our kids that we've kind of lost track of, the logged out students, I think um, somebody referred to them once as, like their work, like I got kids, to be very honest, that are working three jobs because their parents lost their jobs. Uh, and they're working, um, I guess FedEx is hiring around here and they work a 1.30 to 9.30 shift, 1.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. shift. And then they're working at maybe CeCe's Pizza and doing some other stuff all at the same time. And I think that is a definite challenge. And so how do we reconnect when you, we can't really safely do home visits, right? And we can't really safely do um, like drive-bys to their jobs, unless you're like going to Kroger and they work there, but you can't safely go into those environments. And not to say folks aren't doing that anyway, because like I got a picture, like I talked to such and such today. I was like, how did you talk to them? But I think that has been one of the biggest challenges, but we've really been intentional and the school division has been very supportive in focusing on the needs of, of our students and our staff. But I think that's the hardest piece is that I'm used to having them here in the building and reassuring, like, how do you reassure a parent that stuff is going to be okay? When sometimes you just need that, that calming presence with you, that's what we provided. So we really had to be creative in, in the ways that we figure out how to provide some of, some of what used to be there. So I think that was the most challenging part. And it still faces, because we're getting ready to have graduation. And it's challenging. I, I can't shake my kids' hands. I can't hug them. I could, but I'm a high-risk category. I have asthma. Right. Um, and I have um, a really bad asthma that I'm medicated. And people like looking... Like I run and I work out and I eat healthy, but I, I'm, uh, I have asthma, so I'm not a person that can be out here shaking hands and hugging kids. And my kids understand that, but it's gonna, that part is the hardest part. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so you're heading, we're heading into summer, right? And you have a chance to transition between school years. You're also transitioning to this new job, which puts you in charge of some strategic planning at the district level, right? And working with others to help make that happen. So considerations or challenges moving forward? What's the, what is your school and or the district thinking about as we head into summer and fall? Um, right now, I think everybody in our school division is in the, in the same place. What does summer look like for our students? Because we usually have about 10,000 different programs running um, where there's summer enrichment and there's summer rem like remediation programs and there's summer school. So right now we're in the throes of summer planning and that isn't easy when you start thinking about a school division that was not one-to-one -to, -one to start with and how do you get devices, enough devices. Um, our division is going one-to-one, -one, six to 12 next year. So that is a benefit, but really right now our focus is uh, just getting summer situated and then just taking it one step at a time. Like what, what, now that we're gonna get through graduation in maybe two weeks. Um, and then the next thing is how do we address summer enrichment and summer learning in the ways that we've done previously? And then how do we then move forward to how are we plan? And I'm sure the division is working on like the responsible return plan and wait every day. We're all on Friday waiting for the governor's announcements. Like, what does he say today? So, you know, I think that's where as a school division we are. And for me, my transition is really focusing on making sure my, my administrative team and my instructional leadership team are well-versed in remote leadership. Mm -hmm. Because 
having a new building principal come in um, and you don't know what their skill set will be or what their comfort level will be, having a team that is already, I'm not going to say strong, like they're the rock, but having a team that is proficient in remote leadership and some of the strategies that we've used, I feel like will make it an easier transition for someone coming in. And um, so that's kind of where my focus is, mm -hmm. division and at the building level, get through graduation, get, get summer school straight, and then whatever comes from in the, in the next couple of months, it comes and we handle it as we, as we get there. But really for me personally in this transition, making sure my team is shored up on these practices because it doesn't look like we're going to be returning to a normal environment and there may be some still some need for remote leadership and i would i would be remiss if i didn't mention the concerns around digital equity um because we still have to champion that just because a kid has access they don't necessarily always have the digital capital necessary to engage in a way that is authentic and that they're getting value from it and one of the conversations and one thing i continue to harp on and i know people are tired of me saying it is that just because a kid has a phone doesn't mean that they ha we live in a place of data privilege i have not had minutes on my phone or i had to worry about data in years like i'm on an unlimited plan but when we're thinking about kids submitting assignments and families who share data like we live in a place of data privilege and we have to recognize that because in that vein of digital equity, access is one thing, but you're not really access, you don't have access for real. You have a minimal window that you're able to do. So that, that, that would be a challenge and consideration even moving forward as we start to begin, as all schools start to begin to plan for what the reopening may look like is it's not just about giving a kid a Chromebook and a hotspot or giving, saying they have their phone. Like, what is it? How are you building their digital capital in a way that they can engage authentically with these assignments with teachers? How are we providing them that support? So, yeah, absolutely. All right, Shamika, we're at the end of our time here. Uh, oh, thank if you're not following Shanika Gerald, she's an amazing tech savvy equity focused school leader in Virginia. I'll make sure to put links into the blog post. And uh, Shanika, really appreciate your time today. Good luck with the end of the school year. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me.